Welcome to the webinar on Parenting Challenging Behaviors in Children. I'm Dr. Janet Ma. I'm a registered psychologist at BC Children's Hospital in the Outpatient Mental Health Program. I acknowledge the land on which we are on is traditionally territory of the Coast Salish peoples, and I strive to honor and nurture the land for one and all. I'll be talking about parenting strategies to address behavioral difficulties in children ages 3 to 12, uh, this will include behavioral difficulties such as non-compliance or not listening or following through with instructions, tantrums, or physical or verbal aggression. The strategies are all grounded in science and may need some adaptations for neurodiverse populations such as kids with autism or developmental disabilities. You may recognize a lot of the uh, strategies that may be familiar to you. And just like using tools from a toolbox, the goal is to understand the proper use for each tool and for which purpose. And acknowledging that there's no one tool that will work perfectly, and there's no pressure to use all the tools at once either. The pyramid model is a good way to conceptualize the range of tools I'll discuss today. Strategies will build upon each other, and in order to be most effective, your foundations have to be strong both in terms of quality as well as quantity. So the strategies towards the bottom of the pyramid should be your main go-to ones and used more frequently than the strategies at the top of the pyramid. At the core foundation of parenting is investing in positive relationships with your child. This is important because we all have an emotional tank that gets drained with each demand or instruction. So kids with behavioral challenges are often running on low, just struggling through the morning routine before heading out the door. And kids are less resilient when their emotional tank is running empty, which can result in more blow-ups in the face of more demands or stressors. So the key is to continually fill and refill their emotional tank throughout the day. And the best way to do that for kids at this age is through positive time and attention. Uh, so children will respond to any attention, whether it's positive or negative. So if you walk into a room and see these three kids, it's natural that you would want to go and break up the fight first. But the important thing is to not to take it for granted that the third child was playing appropriately before you move on to something else. So the challenge is, how often are you just putting out fires? Or how often are you also soaking up the sun of your child's life? A concrete strategy to help fill up your child's emotional tank with positive attention is to catch your child being good. So provide attention, praise, and special activities for times when your child is behaving appropriately. And for the best effect, make sure that you're praising your child as soon as possible rather than waiting to the end of the day to do so. Also give specific praise where you're describing what it is that you like seeing more of. So instead of saying, good job, uh, then saying, oh, I like how you shared your toys with your sister. Also try to avoid backhanded compliments where you're saying things like, um, you did so well today, but why can't you do this every time? So you want to praise and debit uh, into the emotional tank without then negating that good work by adding in any criticism immediately. So praise is a good strategy where it adds to that emotional tank bit by bit, and you want to do that throughout the day consistently. But another strategy to give like a bigger boost in refilling the tank is child-directed play. In this, you're trying to set aside at least 10 to 15 minutes uh, daily or every few days for undivided attention with your child, where you are simply following your child's lead. Um, most of the days, they have to follow our instructions and what uh, we want them to do. So during this specific period of time, we are really trying to fill up their emotional tank, so don't... Uh, uh, drain their tank by giving instructions or asking questions or criticism during this time. That also means that you're not just a passive uh, uh, observer of their play, you're an active participant. So praising anything that you like seeing your child doing, reflecting what you're hearing your child saying, imitating what they're doing, following along and doing what you see, 
and also narrating. So almost being kind of like a sportscaster and describing what your child is doing. And importantly, have fun and be together. We are human beings, not human doings. So at the foundation of parenting strategies is establishing positive relationships, which then fills up the emotional tank. So ways to do that would be to catch your child being good by providing positive attention and specific and immediate praise, as well as uh, daily and regular child-directed play. The second level of the pyramid is on uh, structured environments, uh, which really sets up the framework um, to, for your child to succeed. And it focus really is on prevention. In behavior management, we often talk about the ABCs of behavior. And so this second level of the pyramid focuses on strategies at the antecedent. So what's going on just before a behavior happens, where you're creating a safe setting designed to minimize the chances of undesired behavior from occurring in the first place. One way to do that is to actually consider how the environment can be arranged or rearranged to prevent problem behavior. So consider your child's basic needs. Are they hungry, tired, cold, sick? Those are all ingredients that could lead to challenging behaviors. So try to address those first. Also consider if your child may be over or under stimulated. Um, and if you can, address their underlying sensory needs. Consider lighting or sounds or temperature or movement. Also pay attention to common triggers and see if you can limit access to them. So maybe putting away distractions in the house. We all know that a picture is worth a thousand words, so use visual cues to pair with your verbal instructions. And this can help reduce your need to constantly repeat yourself or remind your child or go into kind of this nagging mood. For instance, consider giving your child a wait card to hold on to while they're waiting. Checklists of tasks that uh, could be done can be uh, helpful. And it's really useful to be creative in how these checklists may be presented. Um, Pinterest uh, is a nice uh, way to get some ideas and how to create things that are new and appealing, uh, like the popsicle sticks of jobs, or taking photos of your child actually doing each step. Kids have also a poor sense of time, so when you give warnings about there's five minutes left before a transition, uh, try to pair that with a visual to actually show the amount of time remaining, like using an hourglass or a time timer. There's also lots of free phone apps that kind of do the similar way thing. How you give instructions is also key in setting up your child for success. You know, we're often busy and multitasking, taking uh, care of a variety of different things all at once. And so when we give instructions to our child, they may not have actually heard us or have chosen to ignore us until we have to repeat ourselves. And with each repetition, we all get more upset. So take the time to get your child's attention first. Um, go physically and touch their shoulder, get eye contact, and ask them to repeat uh, the instructions so that we know that they've heard us. Keep the instructions short and simple, really breaking steps into one part at a time. And being firm and direct in your tone of voice and not giving instructions in question form, okay? Because when we do that, it gives your child an immediate opportunity to say no. Uh, use positive phrasing. So uh, tell what you want to see your child doing instead of just what you want them to stop doing. So like use your indoor voice as opposed to saying stop shouting. Use the first then rule. Uh, so First, do something that they don't want to do, and then they get something that they, they would like doing better. And a strategy that works really well for avoiding power struggles is to give appropriate choices. 
This gives kids this sense of control, so they're more willing to comply with something that they've chosen or had a say in rather than just being told. So uh, if it's time to get ready for bed, the choice is not whether to do it or not, uh, but the choice might be in what task to do first, putting on pajamas or brushing teeth first, or choices in how to do it. Maybe you want to have a race to see who can do it all faster, um, or you know, uh, who can be super quiet like a ninja while you're doing it, and also choices of who to do it with. So that second layer of the pyramid is about creating supportive environments that can prevent certain triggers or misbehaviors from happening. So consider the physical needs and arrangements of the environment, using visual aids, transition warnings, and giving effective instructions, breaking things down into small parts, and giving choices when appropriate. Uh, the third level of the pyramid is on skills training, and it's really about teaching kids what to do in place of the challenging behavior. It helps to reframe a child's behavior away from viewing them as purposefully manipulative um, so that you're understanding that the kids do well if they can. And if they can't, it's because they don't have the social, communication, or regulation skills that they need to engage in more appropriate interactions. So with this mindset shift, we can be more proactive in supporting our kids with the skills deficit rather than being reactive to their challenging behaviors. We want to identify the best teachable moments. And the worst time to teach a child to use new skills is in the moment of high distress. It's just like physiotherapy. If you have a weak muscle, you need to work on it in calm, structured, systematic ways where you're practicing it in order to build strength and capability in order to apply it and use it effectively in more complex situations. So first, introducing the skill in fun and positive ways when everyone is calm outside of any kind of trigger or context. And then, uh, before an anticipated trigger, you're cueing the child and reminding them about those skills that you were discussed or practicing. And then, actively helping guiding them to actually use it and apply it along the way. Also, after a big blow up has happened, try to keep the debriefing short and sweet. And that's because everybody's emotional tank is running low or empty at that time. So it's not the time to have a big teaching moment or a big lesson or review. Um, it's more time to have a kind of a short reflection of how difficult it was and an invitation to uh, revisit it and talk about how to help support them when everybody's feeling better. There's a variety of different skills that could be related to challenging behaviors in children, but many families struggle with emotion regulation, so I'll be focusing on that in this talk today. There's three components of emotion regulation, which I'll go through. To promote emotional awareness, be a good role model and talk about your own feelings and how you cope. Kids also get defensive when they're asked to talk about their own emotions, especially the negative ones. So instead, use books or games or art or TV characters to talk about emotions instead of focusing on the child alone. And Daniel Siegel has this hand model of the brain, which demonstrates that when we have big emotions, our rational control center of our brain kind of goes offline as we essentially flip our lid and our emotion center kind of takes over. So at this time, we're less responsive to any advice or reasoning that's trying to target this rational part of our brain when we're upset. So instead, we want to validate our child's feelings um, by saying, I understand you're feeling angry because it's hard, because it hurts, because it's not fair. Um, and when you're sticking with that validation, it actually helps to contain and defend 
deflate the emotional flare up, which then gives more space for the rational brain to come back online. And then your child can make, uh, is in a better space to make good choices later and faster. Helping kids uh, become aware and describing how they feel is important. And there's a variety of different um, metaphors or analogies or programs to do this. Uh, one example is the so zones of regulation, which is often used in a lot of schools nowadays. Also, I like the angry volcano where, you know, something starts to trigger you and you're kind of bubbling, bubbling, and then eventually you might explode. The key to any of these uh, identification of emotion strategies is really teaching your child to catch those early signs of emotional distress, the yellow zones or the bubbling zones before the big blow up. Because when you're catching it early, that's when the strategies to try to help cool down and regulate the emotions are way more effective. So doing it sooner is more effective than later on. Once you've helped your child uh, better identify their emotions, you'll also need to help teach them how to cope with those emotions, and relaxation is helpful. Deep breathing is often helpful because your breath is always with you, but for kids, just telling them to breathe uh, sometimes is difficult. So again, using visuals or concrete aids or tools can help, whether it's blowing on pinwheels or bubbles or uh, the glitter jar analogy, where you know all the glitter swirling around in the jar represents the chaos and the turmoil of your angry thoughts and feelings. And what we need to do is kind of uh, create a calm space and breathe through it so that the glitter can settle and the dust settles. Progressive muscle relaxation can also help where you are systematically tensing different parts of your body, holding it for a few seconds before letting go. Um, it's kind of like the elastic band where the more you kind of tense and tighten and then uh, you let go, it becomes a little bit more loose. For kids, uh, different ways to make it fun and engaging would be maybe talking about being a tin soldier and all rigid versus kind of a flip floppy rag doll. You can use tools like stress balls or, or heavy work. Also, you can think about visualization or guiding them in, in the imagining kind of your safe, calm, uh, happy place. For adults, it often is uh, thinking about, you know, a beach scene or a quiet forest. For kids, it could be something totally imaginary, like Candyland in the clouds. If you uh, search the internet or on YouTube, there's plenty of different resources and, and uh, guided scripts and scenarios in helping kids with breathing, muscle relaxation, and imagery. So you can give those a try. Also, it might be helpful to create a chill out area. It might be a favorite part of the house or their room or, you know, those IKEA tents where uh, you're putting in lots of tools that can help them just take a break um, and, and relax. Having, you know, dim lighting or music or books or coloring sheets. Um, and this chill out area is used as a coping mechanism to calm down. It's viewed in a positive way as an active strategy, not so much a timeout as a punishment to be sent to. Often when we're angry, we also have hot thoughts, like life is so unfair or I hate this. Um, and so it's helpful to teach kids some cooling thoughts that are more realistic and more helpful. Uh, using humor in particular can help to shift from kind of the negative bias into something more positive. Uh, problem solving is helpful to prepare for challenging uh, situations. So uh, key tips with uh, problem solving with your child would be to identify your child's perspective about what the problem is. Uh, this ensures that their voice is heard and that they feel validated and that they're on board with the system. 
In the brainstorming of solutions, the research actually shows that it's most important to get a variety of different options to be generated, even if they're not really the best solution. It's about the variety because it leads to more flexible thinking, which would be tied to more future success and resilience. Uh, also, we, uh, when we're then trying to narrow down all the different solutions, um, then more guidance would be needed to find, you know, the most feasible or realistic one, and then having parent guidance and evaluating and adjusting over time as well. Okay, so the third level of pyramid is about skills training to teach kids the skills that they're lacking uh, to replace, you know, the challenging behaviors that are, uh, they're acting out in. And often with emotion regulation, we want to increase awareness and validation of their emotions. And then coping with the big emotions through relaxation, coping thoughts, and problem solving. At the tip of the pyramid are behavior plans, which rely on all the other foundational levels of the pyramid model. And the behavior plan strategies are really applied to specific uses. Um, we want to, again, back to the ABCs of behavior, we want to better understand the child's behavior and make sure that their challenging behaviors aren't working for him or her. So there's often different functions of behavior, why kids act out, uh, what they're trying to seek. So uh, if it's sensory related, kids might be doing it in order to kind of get that feel good sensation or stimulation, like the need to kind of touch everything at the store. To respond to this type of need, you want to provide a sensory alternative. It could be providing fidgets or jewelry or headphones. Sometimes kids act the way they do for attention, to get a reaction or response out of somebody. Uh, an example of this would be interrupting when the parents are on the phone. So to respond to this function would be to make sure you're providing attention for positive behaviors because that reinforces the good behaviors to happen more and then withdraw the attention that is fueling uh, the misbehavior. So you're praising uh, kids for using their quiet voice and not paying attention when they're yelling. For uh, kids that are trying to escape from something, to avoid doing things that they don't want to do, like if they're uh, having a temper tantrum when they're asked to clean up, then a good way to approach that would be to make that task more desirable by maybe breaking it down into smaller steps um, and adding an incentive for motivation. And finally, a possible function of the behavior that kids could do is um, in order to act out, in order to get something that they want. Um, so, you know, hitting a child in order to get the toy that they want or refusing to stop screen time. So to respond to this, we want to ensure that these kind of privileges that they want are actually things to be earned. Um, so first they have to work or ask politely before they get what they want. All right. Inevitably, uh, no matter how much you know, invest in a positive time and attention, try to change the environment to prevent you know, misbehaviors from happening in the first place, as well as teaching skills, um, sometimes you have, you know, the misbehavior happens and you have to respond. Um, and that's the C of the ABCs. Um, so how do we respond appropriately? Again, it depends on the function of the behavior. If the behavior is done in order to get something like attention, then we want to use the strategy of differential attention. You're removing a parent's attention in order to decrease behaviors that are fueled by attention. These uh, behaviors would be things like whining, arguing, negotiating, interrupting, swearing. Um, you can sense that these kind of behaviors are actually, uh, the more you engage in them, the more they happen and repeat. So we want to kind of cut off the oxygen to these types of behaviors.
And instead, you are then providing attention for positive behaviors that you want to see more of, which actually includes the absence of the misbehavior. So uh, as soon as your child stops whining or tantruming, you're giving attention, positive attention back. Words of caution about using this strategy. Do not ignore dangerous or escape behaviors. If your child doesn't want to put on their helmet or their seatbelt, that's not a time to ignore that. Also, anticipate and ignore the backlash too. When using this strategy, it gets worse before it gets better. Uh, parenting in this way is like being a vending machine. Your child knows how to push your buttons to get a response. And if they don't get what they expect, then they're going to push harder and escalate by pounding and yelling to see if they can get their way. So stay true to the course. And when they stop, even if it's for a moment, immediately praise them. And that is what kind of helps reset for them what actually gets, what type of behaviors gets rewarded with attention. This is one of the most tricky strategies to implement well, so please do check whether you can follow through because giving in later is actually worse because then you're reinforcing the intensified behavior of pounding or yelling. Um, this is most often what happens when I hear uh, families talk about their kids going from zero to a hundred in a lickety split. Um, and that's because kids have learned and internalized over time the patterns where they will get what they want if they escalate. So they're just going to skip all the steps in between. Okay. If your child is misbehaving in order to avoid something then you don't want to ignore, uh, you want to provide an incentive to motivate your child to do something new or effortful or difficult. Um, so it's like your child is seeing this obstacle in front of them, um, but they might be more willing to climb the mountain if there is a prize to achieve at the other side. Incentives are different than bribery. Uh, bribes are either given before they do something, so you don't want to give the prize before they actually climb the mountain because then there's no motivation to do so. Also, bribes are given in reaction to a child's behavior. Uh, if your child is having a big temper tantrum and then you bring out the prize of if you calm down, then you'll get you know, a reward, that's in reaction to the child's behavior, and they will learn that, oh, if I want to get a reward offered, I'm going to um, escalate first. So we don't want to do that. Be more proactive instead of reactive again. Many families will say that they've tried sticker charts and other incentive kind of systems, and they often work a little bit, but then the interest fades after a couple weeks. And that is a common thing I hear. And so there's a t uh, there are tricks and tools to try to make incentives work longer over time. Uh, one more thing to consider is to make that behavior goal, what you're asking your child to do, to be realistic. Uh, you're choosing just one or maybe two maximum targets. You're not trying to incentivize every behavior that your child needs to do the one kind of primary target you want to focus on, um, and then making that target just outside of what they're currently able to do. Rewards also have to be appealing. So get your child's input and pay attention to what it is that they're asking for, uh, what it is that they really want. Rewards have to be varied. So using a menu of different options from like smaller appetizer items that are easier and quicker to earn versus, you know, special dessert items that can take a lot longer to achieve. Uh, rewards have to be unique. So they can't be easily obtained through other means or else what's the motivation to do something hard or difficult if they can just get it for free. Uh, rewards also have to be frequent enough. So do encourage your child to earn and, uh, and get a reward every few days at least, even if they're saving up for a bigger item longer term. 
And finally, rewards have to be updated. Um, so just like at a restaurant with their menu, you have to add in new items um, that uh, are appealing. And also even changing up how the menu looks and is presented. Um, uh, if you start with a ch sticker chart, that can kind of wear off, you know, interest over time. Then you switch it into, you know, earning marbles or poker chips or points instead. Um, uh, and so the same principle of earning incentives uh, will help with motivation, but the creativity and how it's presented can, can uh, maintain that motivation over time. And then as your child is building in good habits and through maturity, then the rewards can be gradually faded over time so that they're not relying on getting a reward for every single time they're doing something. You can either increase the amount of time it takes before they get a reward or level up in terms of the behavior target. It gets more, you have to do something more difficult before you get a reward. But make sure you're keeping up with that social praise, regardless of if they're getting a reward or not. Again, back to the foundation of the pyramid, making sure that we're giving them positive feedback and pay attention when they are doing uh, positive things. Consequences may need to be used in order to teach your child that, um, you know, responsibility for wrongdoings. Natural consequences are things like if you don't finish eating, then you'll be hungry later and I'm not going to make you a different snack or a different meal. Logical consequences are things like if you break a lamp, then you'll have to pay for it. There are also maybe times where if your child chooses to continually misbehave, you might um, uh, take away a special privilege. So no screen time or maybe being grounded. Uh, it's important to know that research shows that to be most effective, you want to kind of withdraw um, or take away a, a privilege for a period of less than 24 hours. So when families say, you know, you, you have no screen time for a week or a whole month, it's actually less effective than just doing it uh, one day at a time. Uh, consequences should be used infrequently. Uh, so again, the idea with the pyramid is that you're focusing on using more positive reinforcement, incentive kind of system, um, rather than negatives. And so you're choosing to do more positives, at least three times more positive strategies than negative punishment-based strategies. Time out is often a sensitive and misunderstood strategy. Um, time out is best used um, for times where the child is purposefully, intentionally breaking the rules, particularly severely enough that for like physical aggression. Um, the timeout is actually used to, to remove somebody from a desired activity that they want to kind of continue on, but during that activity, they broke the rules. So I like to explain it to kids as kind of the hockey penalty box. Um, just like in hockey, there are rules to be maintained, and if you break those rules, you get a penalty. And the penalty is short. For kids, um, the penalty should be a maximum of five minutes initially. And even professional adult hockey players know in the penalty box, you're serving your time calmly. It's to your best interest to do so because if you're yelling at the referee, if you're throwing your sticks around, more time gets added. And this is why it's important to use a strategy when uh, your kid is motivated to rejoin the game. If they're trying to escape from that activity in the first place, then this is not a good match for that strategy. Um, also, once they've served their time, then uh, you, they get released from the penalty box, they can rejoin the game. There's no big long lecture or, or debrief kind of session. Um, they, most often kids understand what it is that they did wrong um, and they've served their time and they can kind of go back and rejoin the game. Timeout is always used in combination with the other strategies in the context of positive relationship. 
And it's used for aggressive, like intentional, non-cooperative behaviors. Time out should not be used as a punishment for having big feelings of sadness, uh, fear, or being in distress. And there are ways to implement timeout effectively, and there are lots of ways to use timeout ineffectively. So if you're struggling with this approach, I encourage you to seek out more resources or support to kind of troubleshoot. And uh, remember with the emotion regulation, uh, level three of the pyramid, we talked about chill out. Um, we want to use chill out as a way to calm down, as a positively framed kind of approach. Um, and that is a very different uh, look compared to what timeout is in terms of punishment for misbehavior. So the tip of the pyramid is on very specific behavior plans. We want to focus on more positive strategies opposed to the negative punishment consequences. We want to, uh, we want to address what is the underlying function of the child's behavior because how you respond to that function will differ um, and you need to use the right tool to address the right problem. Uh, tools could be include things like differential attention, paying attention to things you want to see more of, and removing attention from things that you want to see less of, uh, using incentives for motivation, or using consequences for uh, severe misbehavior. Okay. Common challenges in applying these strategies. Um, a lot of times, uh, families struggle with consistently implementing these strategies across time, across people or caregivers in a child's life, or across situations like at home or at school or in public. Also, I see a lot of families trying to do too many strategies all at once or trying to target too many behaviors uh, in your child at once. So just kind of picking one or two things to start off with. Don't pick the most severe or most challenging or difficult one because you want to kind of start with something just outside uh, the comfort zone to kind of build momentum and set everybody up for success before you move on to more complex, difficult items. I've seen families giving up on strategies too soon. As we've talked about, there are some strategies where when first implemented, the child's behavior gets worse before it gets better. And that's okay. That's anticipated. We understand the mechanism behind that. It doesn't mean that the strategy doesn't work. It means you have to stay the course and be consistent. So try to um, do a, a new strategy for at least kind of two weeks. Give it a solid effort uh, before giving up. Also, uh, we want to make sure that you're understanding the theory or the principles behind each strategy. You're not going to use this one tool for every single uh, scenario because some tools just are mismatched and could actually inadvertently perpetuate the problem. Also, uh, avoid using these strategies only when your child's emotional intensity or your own emotional intensity is high. As I said, uh, even the best uh, strategies will be less effective when uh, everybody's in higher distress. Uh, also, try not to focus on the negatives more than the positives. There could be ways where we might be inadvertently reinforcing misbehavior by paying more attention and engaging in them. Also, we want to be aware of the other side, where we're inadvertently punishing good behavior by taking it for granted and not giving the attention that it's due. So I've brought up a lot of different strategies and hope that you've gained more clarity and confidence in how and when to use the parenting tools effectively. And each strategy may require some fine tuning to apply to your unique situations. So please do access more resources and supports to help you troubleshoot. Finally, I want to acknowledge that parenting is the easiest thing in the world to have an opinion about, but the hardest thing in the world to do. So there's no perfect algorithm. There's no perfect implementation. 
But I believe that having good intentions combined with these credible insights of when and how to do the strategies effectively, as well as plenty of compassion for yourself and your child when things get tough, those things can go a long way. So thank you so much for watching this webinar. This project was done in partnership with the BC Children's Kelty Mental Health Resource Center. If you're looking for additional resources or information to support your child's mental health, or if you'd like to speak to a parent peer support worker, please don't hesitate to contact the Kelty Center at the phone number or email address on this slide.